Greetings to everybody. It is really fun for me to be here today, and I want to thank Terna for inviting me to say a brief welcome. Um, I love having colleagues from across the museum community, and I love the mix that we have of conservators and registrars and art handlers and packers and all the, the, the people who we know are on the front lines of caring for the objects, uh, moving the objects, installing the objects, displaying them. You are the, the people who make the magic happen that our visitors are so delighted to come and see. Um, it's been really fun for us to partner with the Foundation for the American Institute for Conservation. They have been splendid partners in organizing and preparing everything today. I want to particularly call out Abigail Chaudhry for her excellent work working with Tirna. And I can't really say enough great stuff about Tirna Doherty. Many of you know her already. Uh, she has been a great leader for us in the field of conservation. She heads the conservation team for the Smithsonian American Art Museum and oversees programming for the Lunder Conservation Center. She has been very dynamic in rallying the professional community on all kinds of issues. Just in September, she did a conference about CO2 cleaning techniques. And for those of you who want an excuse to come back in February, she is planning a new conference co-organized with the Getty Museum on LEDs for February next year. Um, she actually came to us a few years ago from the Getty and has wide con connections both across America and abroad. Um, and in that sense, I'm really excited to hear our keynote speaker today, Dr. David Saunders from the British Museum, um, bringing, I hope, a comprehensive and global perspective to the issues we're talking about. I can't help but thank our many sponsors. You know, hey, we got beautiful folders and refreshments and all those things happen only because of the sponsors. So a big call out to Artex Fine Art Services, to Gaylord Archival, TrueView Inc., and to Masterpack for making today's conference happen. Um, I know everyone's real excited to get on, so I just want to say Please, if you have a few minutes at lunch or elsewhere, I hope you tour the building and see all the wonderful collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and our partners, the National Portrait Gallery. They're intermingled on all three floors of this building. My personal advice is to start on the third floor and work down because the truly exceptional, amazing architectural spaces are up on the third floor. But the whole building is fascinating. It's a it's a great historic landmark building constructed to be the patent office in the 1830s. And I won't go off on too much more about that, but if you do have a few minutes, be sure to take time to explore. Tirna, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. I was prepared uh, to introduce myself, but uh, Betsy has done that for me, which is great. And now I just want to take a moment to celebrate part of uh, the American Art Museum that is the Renwick Gallery. Uh, we've had a slew of opening celebrations just last week because after a period of renovation, the gallery has been opened with temporary site-specific installations. Uh, here you see a piece by Leo Villarreal in the foreground and that green glass far in the back is um, a Chihuly piece that is part of our collection. Uh, other artists represented include Maya Lin and Gabriel Da, and the current exhibition is titled Wonder. Built by Mr. Corcoran in 1859 to house his art collection, the Renwick Gallery was the first public art museum in the United States and has since become a gallery to display American craft for the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It's located across the street from the White House at 17th and Pennsylvania Avenue, and if the rain doesn't stop you, it's only a 20, 25 minute walk from here, so I hope at some point you have a chance to visit the Renwick. The Lunder Conservation Center is a visible facility that is shared by the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. It is located on the top, top floors of this museum in the northwest corner. My role at the center is to oversee the programming and public outreach funded by an endowment that was established when the center opened in 2006. And this conference is our biggest event of this calendar year. So we are very grateful to the foundation of the American Institute for Conservation, FAIC, for partnering with us in the organization administration of this conference. 
As Betsy mentioned, oh dear, I see some funny formatting there. Well, the pictures are still visible. Uh, as Betsy mentioned, we held the CO2 symposium and workshop in September, and these are some pictures of the on-site workshop components at the Hirshhorn and here at the Lunder Conservation Center. Staff from the FASC have prepared a questionnaire in the conference folder for you. It's a green colored paper or yellow colored paper, depending on your folder. And we really hope that you will fill out the form and make suggestions for lectures, workshops, or conferences so that between the Lunder Conservation Center, FAIC, and AIC, we can better serve the large community of colleagues who work with museum collections. The idea for this conference came out of conversations I had with Helen Ingalls, Objects Conservator for American Art. I had worked previously as a paintings conservator, where, for the most part, I could relish in not having to ever answer a question about whether something passed an audio test. Those of us in conservation know that the majority of inquiries about materials will fall to the objects conservators. When I came to the Smithsonian American Art Museum to head the conservation department, I quickly learned about the challenges to conservators, designers, and registrars, the challenge they faced when asked about what materials are suitable for use with art objects on exhibition. I've spoken to numerous colleagues, including most speakers today, about the lack of reliable information published on material testing, the lack of consistency in test results in the field, the concerns people have of sharing results publicly, and the fact that no one really wants to take on the task of carrying out tests that can take a long time or may not seem to count as rigorous scientific analysis. It became clear to me that museum colleagues would benefit from discussions about what questions we need to ask about materials and how to best answer them. Our call for papers solicited many good contributions. We decided on a two-day program with a few short poster presentations. These posters are short contributions to the PDF abstract book that is now available on the AIC website, and they will be presented tomorrow afternoon. For today's program, I'd like to thank the scientific committee who helped in the selection of papers. The committee included Jennifer Bosworth, Susan oh. Heald, Emily Kaplan, Dr. Chris Maness, and Christopher Weiner. Chris Maness is to thank for the PDF abstract book that we can download. There will be no publication from this conference. Talks are being recorded, and we plan to have the talks posted online within a few months. We quickly realized that textiles were not part of the program and acknowledged that colleagues are meeting this week in New York for the North American Textile Conservation Conference. So we have a good reason to organize another conference on this theme in the future. Generous donations in support of our program and evening reception were made without hesitation by Artex Fine Art Services, Gaylord, TrueView Incorporated, and Masterpack to FAIC. And details about our evening reception tonight are in your folder. Chris Weiner, former program coordinator for the Lunder Conservation Center, helped in the initial planning for this conference before his promotion to work in exhibitions and program planning at the Baltimore Museum of Art. I am therefore all the more grateful that Abigail Chaudhry and Sarah Citron from AIC have worked with us in managing the registration and production of materials for the conference. I'd like to thank Susan Edwards, Conservation Technician for American Art, who has helped with many of the administrative details for the conference at our museum. Colleagues from my own conservation department were gracious to be up bright and early to help with registration and will be helping throughout the day as we try to usher you back into the auditorium from coffee breaks to stay on schedule. We do not have a tour planned of the Lunder Conservation Center. However, anyone with Smithsonian badges can introduce you to staff from the American Art Museum or National Portrait Gallery if you have questions about the center or work you may have seen through the glass walls. At this time, I will ask you to silence your phones. This auditorium has excellent Wi-Fi, so you will receive calls and text messages. In the event of an emergency, um, we can shelter in place in this auditorium. It's a space designated for that. Or evacuate the building through the entrance you came in, or you can follow me out the back of the stage. I will now introduce our keynote speaker, our esteemed colleague from London, Dr. David Saunders. David Saunders is an honorary research fellow at the British Museum, 
where he was keeper of the Department of Conservation and Scientific Research from 2005 to 2015. After obtaining a doctorate in chemistry and a period of postdoctoral research, he joined the scientific department at the National Gallery London in 1985, where he worked for 20 years. His research interests include the deterioration of museum objects, particularly pigments and painted surfaces, and the effect of display and storage environments on such damage. He is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London and a fellow and vice president of the International Institute for Conservation, IIC. From 2003 to 2009, he was IIC Director of Publications, editing its journal, Studies and Conservation. From 1990 to 2009, and the proceedings of its 2006, 8, and 2010 Congresses. He also edits the British Museum Technical Research Bulletin. Please join me in welcoming David. Uh, thank you, Tiana. Thank you uh, for that very flattering introduction. Um, Tiana asked me to, to say something to open the conference. Uh, the instructions are, say something of general interest and don't steal anyone's material. So I've, <laughs> I've tried to do this. I, I've looked through the program and I hope that no one will be sitting there with their head in their hands thinking, oh, I was going to say that. So I've done something which I hope is not too obscure in response to that. Um, and I wanted to think today about the, the history, how we've come to, to the today's situation with materials testing, with the way we go about selecting things for use in exhibitions, storage, packing environments. And I wanted to start with this man, Loftus St. George Bine. Um, now, those of you who have heard of him are probably thinking, oh, no, not again. Those of you who are not, well, a little bit of history. Uh, in 1899, uh, Bine, who was... Um, a collector of shell specimens, received some specimens of shells from the Natural History Museum at South Kensington in London. And he discovered that many of these had a white growth on them. Now, this paper that he published originally in 1899 has been reproduced recently in the Getty series, Readings in Preventive Conservation. So if you want to go back and look at the original text, it's available. But essentially, he discovered that in some of the cabinet drawers, these shells were deteriorated, in others they were not. And that the damage occurred particularly in those drawers which were kept well sealed, or reasonably well sealed, drawers that were closed, so an environment built up. He looked at a number of potential reasons for this. He thought it might be because of damp, it might be sulfuric acid, which was present in the atmosphere in London at the time. Um, he thought that it might be something... Uh, due to the specimen itself. And he did a little bit of analysis work and determined that this material, calcium butyrate, or calcium butanoate, was present uh, on the shells. And he thought that this was probably due to the fact that the mollusk that had once been in the shell had decayed, produced a gas, and caused the uh, white efflorescence on the surface. He also found a bit of calcium acetate and his theory was that the gum that was used for some of the labels within the showcase, or sorry, the storage case, had uh, fermented in some way, producing acid which had reacted with the shells. And so I want to use Bein's observations as a starting point for looking at five different aspects of uh, materials testing, pollution, and its interaction with museum objects. And so I have five questions, and we'll go through each of those in turn. So to start with, why put the shelves in quite well-sealed drawers? What was the reason for this storage mode? Well, at the time Bine was writing at the end of the 19th century, as in many previous centuries, the main preoccupation was keeping things away from an outside atmosphere. The air in many cities was, was very polluted at this time, and even then, this was not a new phenomenon. If we refer to uh, ancient periods where the use of fires for heating, for light, was prevalent, we can see examples of references to the fact that materials have to be kept away from sources of pollution if they're not to be soiled. There's this quote from uh, the Odyssey where Homer writes that they... 
are taking the armour away, he's talking um, about trying to deceive the suitors of Penelope. But he's saying the excuse we can use is that we need to take the armour because it's been soiled by being in the smoke and near the fires. Now, of course, we don't know whether this was really the case. Um, it's, after all, a story that they were telling in order to, to meet their own ends. But it suggests that this was possibly a credible story, that armour routinely was sullied by being in these atmospheres where smoke and other gases produced by combustion would, have, would affect it. Slightly more concrete evidence from the diarist John Evelyn in 1661, when he writes in his pamphlet which advocates uh, measures for producing cleaner air in the city of London, that smoke sullies movables, tarnishes plate, gildings and furniture, and it, it, he uses this fabulous phrase that it insinuates its way into things, um, that it, it spreads yellowness on pictures and hangings. And indeed, Evelyn's view was that you know, precious things should be moved away from London, that the factories and other uh, industries, particularly the dyeing industries and tanning industries, which produced a lot of smoke, should be moved away so that they no longer polluted the atmosphere within London. At the beginning of the 19th century, another set of experiments were being done, not looking so much as smoke, but that the so-called miasma, or the miasmata, that were produced in large cities by the many inhabitants there. Now, I don't want to go into the details of what miasmata uh, might be, but needless to say, when Field, uh, who was a colour man, was looking at the effect of light and other pollutants on pigments, in order to look at miasmata, he suspended samples under the seat of a privy <laughs> to see if they were affected. Uh, and he found, you know, which would, make no, would come as no surprise to us with kind of modern knowledge of these things, that particularly lead pigments uh, were, were damaged by being placed in this location. But the main concern seems to continue to be uh, smoke produced by, by many fires and industries that grew up around the centre of London. In 1850, the, well, in the 1850s, there were a series of reports produced for the British government that looked at potentially moving the major museums, the British Museum and the National Gallery, out of the centre of London to new sites. They were going to be moved to the west of the city itself because the prevailing winds took the smoke from industry across the areas where those museums were then located. Now, funding wasn't found to move the museums, but they did suggest that one way of perhaps dealing with this, particularly at the National Gallery, was to glaze and to back all the paintings. And the, the image from the 1870s on the, the left here shows paintings about to be hung in the newly created Barry galleries. And you probably can't see it clearly, but from, you can see from the reflections that they're each glazed. And in fact, by 1860, only 10 years after the report produced by Michael Faraday, the scientist, and Eastlake, who was later director of the National Gallery, uh, they reported that all but one of the paintings, which was particularly large and awkwardly shaped, uh, had been backed. Uh, Faraday was also quite interested in... Uh, if you like, unseen pollution, gaseous pollution. And experiments that he conducted in the 1840s and 1850s indicated that uh, sulfurous acid, which was produced by uh, the reaction of sulfur dioxide from the burning of high sulfur coal, uh, could react with copper vessels uh, or indeed cause rotting of leather. And the leather which he was investigating was in his club in London, uh, the Athenaeum. So we can see that there is this preoccupation with keeping things out, and there are many sources of outdoor pollutants, both those that are gaseous uh, and dust. Some of these are natural, um, but in the urban environments where most of our collections are located, there are these anthropogenic uh, sources for, uh, for dust and for pollutants. So as we mentioned, the burning of coal more recently, of course, uh, the use of internal combustion engines, which produce a variety of different uh, types of gaseous pollutant, all of which there was little control over the ingress uh, into, into museums. But there are also, of course, 
indoor pollutants, um, rather horridly, of course, the major source of dust in, inside our institutions is, is ourselves, uh, the skin and the, the fibres from our clothing, uh, which can form very kind of sticky and uh, insidious materials. And historically, we've, we've had open fires in museums and historic houses, and of course, we've, we've actually allowed smoking uh, in many museums until really quite recently. Um, now, this distinction that's drawn between outdoor and indoor, what, why do we make it? Well, with, with outdoor materials, there's really not so much we can do about controlling it. Uh, the generation of dust and pollutants is really a subject that can only be controlled by kind of national, international policy. Uh, it's quite difficult to stop these materials, if generated outside, coming into our buildings. We can't, for often very good reasons, make our buildings uh, tight so that dust can't get in, and it's even more difficult to make them uh, you know, uh, impermeable to gases, which of course can come in uh, very easily through the fabric and through the very action of having visitors coming in and out of the buildings. There's a bit more control over what happens inside uh, the buildings, and their research practice and policy can have an effect. And so it's, it's that area that really is concerning us when we think about uh, practices for materials in cases and, and testing. And so it is really these, uh, these indoor pollutants, which are now often synonymous with pollutants generated not so much even indoors as within the environments in which we put things to protect them. After all, we're putting things in cases, you know, usually to protect them. If we're putting them in display cases to protect them from the hands of visitors or to maintain an environment for them. If we're putting them in packing cases to protect them uh, during a journey. Um, having said that, there are great differences now in the sort of things we're protecting our collections from than maybe 100 years ago when Bine was writing. Uh, particularly over the last half of the 20th century, a realisation that pollution in our big cities was injurious to health led to changes in legislation. I mean, there was this um, notable smog in London, photochemical smog in London in 1952, and as a result of it, uh, a few years later, the Clean Air Act was passed, which banned the use of very smoky fuels. And if we look at the result of that, in a U this is in a UK context, on the amount of smoke per cubic metre of air and the amount of sulphur dioxide that was generated from the burning of these sulphur-containing coals, you can see this huge drop-off um, over the last part of the 20th century. And uh, another instance of this, uh, this is a uh, major source of coal burnt in the USA during not quite the same period, sort of the 80s to the first decade of the 21st century. And the two solid lines, this shows the use of low sulfur coal, and this shows the use of high sulfur coal. So this switchover from high sulfur to low sulfur which, of course, very much reduces the amount of sulphur dioxide generated in urban atmospheres. And sulphur dioxide was one of the main uh, pollutants associated with deterioration in the, the 19th and early 20th century. And so if we, we, we look at some figures um, for sulphur dioxide from 1970, um, the darker the colour, the higher the concentration. And if, we, if you if we just focus on kind of industrial European countries and, and North America, you can see that moving to 2005, generally much lighter colours. Now, of course, those nations that are suddenly picking up industrially in Asia see an increase in sulphur dioxide during that period because, of course, uh, they, they've not kind of had the lesson um, of high pollutant uh, in earlier periods and are beginning to, to now switch over in the last decade since these figures were produced to try and use lower sulphur coal to reduce those sulphur dioxide levels again. And of course the other pollution, pollutant we're often quite concerned with 
is nitrogen dioxide because of its um, possibility to combine with water to form nitric acid, which can be very damaging to collections. Nitric acid uh, levels seem to be very much related to centres of industrial activity, and you can see that probably if you look at this map and you look at the hot spots for nitrogen dioxide, uh, they correspond very much to large uh, industrial areas and big cities. You, it's rather nice you can pick out certain areas from this. So I think this gives an idea of why at the end of the 19th century you would be putting things in drawers. You, you wouldn't want them exposed to, to London pollutants. Uh, you'd want them to keep... Be, you, your main concern would be keep them clean you would think of this as a benign environment. So what were these degradation products? Well, in the mould of many scientists at the time, the first thing you do when you have a substance that you don't know, you lick it. <laughs> so, you can see here there's an astringent, alum-like taste. I, I wouldn't want to lick these shells. And he also noticed that there was a pungent, vinegar-like odour. Now, of course, for us, this, this would be ringing alarm bells, but, you know, this was not, not quite so well understood. But he, he said that this pointed to acids of the acetic series. But he, he does seem to have been fixated on um, butanoic acid, on this being a calcium butyrate produced on the shells. He found a little bit of calcium acetate, but again, as I mentioned, he thought that this was due to the labels in the, in the, uh, the cases fermenting. Sorry, not the labels, the gum used in the labels. Now, other crystalline deposits of this sort were, were discovered um, in other collections, and there's a very nice example reported uh, in the early 20th century in the uh, Semitic Museum at Harvard, where um, a white efflorescence was found on a salt after it had been in a cherry wood case. One has to be a little bit careful, of course, with these um, crystalline deposits on archaeological material because a lot of them uh, derive not from interaction with the storage environment but simply from uh, the emergence of salts that have been carried within the object in, responses, in response to changes in relative humidity. But analysis of some of these sorts indicated that there were components in them that were, were clearly not from the, uh, the object themselves. The degradation products on the, the shells were looked at again in 1934 by Nichols, and he found at this point that they were, they were calcium acetate. He was much more definite that they were uh, simply the acetate and not necessarily this butyrate. And it wasn't really until the, uh, the 1980s when Norman Tennant uh, looked at these again that using modern instrumentation that he discovered that not only was it a, a, a calcium acetate but there was also a calcium acetate formate. And by this stage it was rather better understood where the source of these materials might lie. At the same time there were reports of another material that was sometimes confused with, with the calcium acetate, but it was actually um, a calcium acetate chloride that was being formed on the surface of objects. It's been named uh, calcocyte. Uh, it's very common, of course, uh, in materials where you have a source of chlorine. So archaeological materials that have been buried in saline environments or that have had contact with salt at some stage uh, post-excavation are particularly prone to forming these crystals. And there were these widespread reports of this throughout the, the middle part of the, the 20th century. At first, uh, another type of efflorescence, which was christened X, efflorescence X, uh, was thought to be uh, calcocyte, but there were certain aspects of its crystal structure that didn't, didn't correspond. And a study of this uh, later in the, the 20th century revealed that it, it was an even more complex salt. It contained, again, the acetate, uh, as had the original uh, Bynes disease efflorescences. But on this occasion, not only was there chloride, again, probably from uh, the burial of the material in a saline environment, uh, 
but there was nitrate, and the nitrate was thought possibly either to come from the burial environment. A lot of nitrates are, of course, produced um, from fertilisers. So in soil which has been subject to the application of fertilisers, the nitrate there can leach into objects. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it can react at this point when acetic acid interacts with the, with the calcium, with the chloride and the nitrate uh, held within the objects to form this salt. Uh, efflorescence X, which was successfully uh, identified in, in the 1990s by, by Tennant working with Gibson uh, at the University of Strathclyde. So it's not only shells, ceramics, other calcium-containing materials which are subject to degradation. Um, there have been many reports of metallic objects being uh, affected by uh, acetic acid. Of course, again, one has to be a bit careful because there are other reasons why you might get salts formed on the surface of, uh, of metals and the pattern that forms on aging. So, for example, the pattern on this bronze vessel here is a mixture of cuprite, the copper oxide, and also some of the calcium uh, chloride hydroxides like uh, atacarmite, paratacarmite, that typically form in a green patina on, uh, on bronzes, brasses, and other copper alloys. But inside the rim of this vessel are some very pale-colored degradation salts. And these were identified um, as acetate-containing and presumably derived from the same mechanism, the uh, action of acetic acid on the copper in the bronze, in this case, uh, in its storage environment. The other metal that's badly affected, in fact, the metal that's most closely associated with the action of acetic acid is lead. And lead has been subjected to acetic acid degradation deliberately uh, over the centuries in order to create the, the familiar pigment lead white. So, as you probably know, in this process, um, lead in some form, either in the form of a buckle or a, of a coil in this case, is uh, placed over a source of acetic acid. I mean, the residual grape skins from wine pressing was the classical uh, material used for this. The acetic acid reacts with the lead, forms lead acetate, and the lead acetate then in turn quite quickly reacts with carbon dioxide in the air to form lead carbonate, which is the classic uh, white pigment. And this has been reported, uh, you know, sort of in the literature going back as far as Pliny, who was clearly even in the first century reporting something that was much earlier. Uh, it's extremely quick. The corrosion of this sort can happen in a few days. Um, like Tiana, I started my career in paintings, and I can remember at the National Gallery one day, to our utter horror, discovering that some lead objects we'd borrowed for an exhibition um, had been in a showcase for about three weeks, and suddenly they were covered in a white powder. And it was because we, we as paintings people, weren't really used to the whole idea of materials testing, and we'd managed to corrode an extremely precious uh, pilgrim's token over the course of three weeks, simply by not being aware of this very rapid reaction with lead. Um, an interesting observation that led to some research into why some lead samples and other lead samples don't uh, deteriorate uh, was conducted a few years ago. Um, they were focusing on two observations, that of stained glass windows where the lead canes that hold the, uh, the glass panels in place were deteriorating, but the solder uh, between the, the lead components was not. And also the fact that in certain medal collections, some lead tokens and medals corroded and others did not. And it was found that it was actually... Ironically, the, the purest material that was most susceptible, you know, you would hope that pure things were, were going to stay around, but actually in this case, if you alloy the lead uh, with other materials, it actually seems to protect it a bit from, from corrosion. We've also seen that uh, as, as early as the 17th century, Evelyn was, was warning about the tarnish of plate in a polluted atmosphere, and the concerns about uh, the miasma that might cause 
reduced sulphur gases that would affect the lead pigments that uh, George Field looked at. Well, by the end of the 19th century, it was quite well understood that it was these reduced sulphur gases, hydrogen sulphide, that was responsible for the formation of metal sulphide tarnishes. And, of course, the biggest example of this was, um, was silver, which was tarnishing quickly. And if you look through all the kind of instructions for the care of collections and materials in historic houses in the 17th and 18th century, you come across an incredible variety of methods for, for cleaning silver, because this removal of tarnish from silver was an ongoing task. And one of the first people to kind of look at it in a rather more scientific way was, uh, was Friedrich Rathgen, uh, who set up the Berlin lab in the, the late 19th century. Now, I'm aware, just to finish, that I haven't dealt with uh, deterioration of, of a huge tranche of materials. I'm probably going to be stealing some of your coffee break as it is. So I thought I'd say I've, I've not really dealt with paper and I've not dealt with glass. I mean, obviously, glass... Uh, the crizzling of glass and the deterioration of glass is well known, and the fact that low-quality papers can be very uh, much affected by, by pollutant gases is also uh, well reported in the literature. And for information about these, uh, these interactions between various different materials and pollutant gases, there are two, uh, well, there are many very good sources, but two I've, I've highlighted here are uh, Pam Hatchfield's book, and also a fairly recent publication by the British Standards Institute, which tabulates um, the pollutant gases and their effect on uh, museum and other historic artefacts. So going back to, uh, to Bynes' disease, we've, we've seen what the pollutant, uh, what the materials on the surface of the shells were, what actually caused this damage. Well, we recall that it was kept in the... It was those that were kept in the sealed environment, and there's this smell of vinegar. Well, Bein doesn't seem to have put these together in the way that we would very obviously. We, we, we would immediately think of the wooden uh, cases that we use. I mean, Bein even comments that in, in some of the cardboard boxes that another museum uses, that they're, they're not there. But again, he doesn't seem to make that, that connection. Um, as early as the late 18th century, uh, Watson, uh, writing in chemical essays, noted, notes that um, when the roofs of churches are dismantled, uh, the pieces of lead, which are close to oak beams, are often covered in what he calls a white pellicle, and that this is often the thickness of half a crown, I don't know what that is in millimetres, but uh, so a thick white coating is noticed where the, the lead is close to these oak beams. And he also notes that it's not always the case that they're present with other types of wood. He quotes deal uh, as a wood which does not produce uh, a lot of deterioration. Deal, I think, deal boards, I think, is a generic name for different types of pine board. And by the beginning of the 20th century, when uh, Alexander Scott was appointed as the first uh, head of the British Museum Lab, he was warning against two very particular types of deterioration that came out of experience that he'd gained by looking, after, looking at the collections that had been taken out of the museum and stored during the war in kind of underground tunnels uh, in London to protect them. And the first of these is that he advises against the storage of medals and other small objects made from lead in oak cases. So th this, is this growing awareness of the fact that woods, particularly oak, uh, can have this bad effect on lead and other materials is beginning to emerge. In the 1920s, there's this first report of the deterioration of lead in combination with another type of wood. As you remember, Watson in, in the 18th century is saying actually it's, it's only really oak that's problematic. So here we have a, an example where pine is found to corrode the lead-covered tele, lead telephone cables. And of course, with hindsight, we now know that you know, there is this hemicellulose component of 
of wood that's the source of, of acetic acid. And that, in fact, on the whole, hardwoods contain rather more of that than softwoods. But th this, this is not a generalisation uh, that, that, that's always helpful, because if we look at some recently tabulated data, we can see that while you know, sort of the, we have very high values for oak here, there are softwoods such as larch down here that have equally high levels of acetic acid released from the wood on breakdown. So I think to, to, to say that you know, wood of one type is benign and wood of another type is extremely damaging is, is a little bit too easy. I mean, we need to be quite careful about the types of wood we use. And I think this is where materials testing can be very helpful in determining just how much uh, gaseous pollutant is, is released by particular materials. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I think this is a subject that will be covered by, by many colleagues over the next two days. But beyond wood, these acidic gases so, and, and aldehyde, so formaldehyde, uh, acetaldehyde, formic and acetic acid, are released by various wood substitutes, plywood, particle board. They have these urea formaldehyde and other um, resin binders. And, of course, there's a, there's a chronology of th their use in the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond as different glues were formulated for the use in these uh, composite boards. There were also, depending on the types of paints to use, those that will release harmful uh, low atomic mass uh, gaseous elements that can be damaging to objects. And the resins that are used to, uh, in glues, wood glues, um, in the binders can also be sources of these low molecular weight uh, pollutants. As I say, I'm not going to go into this in, in huge detail. S Scott's second class of degradation that he felt needed to be avoided was that caused by hydrogen sulfide. He didn't highlight, as others had, the tarnishing of silver, but in his case, he was uh, very interested in this phenomenon quite often observed on watercolour drawings, where lead white um, reacts with hydrogen sulphide, the very phenomenon observed by Field in the early uh, 19th century when he hung lead-containing pigments uh, in, in the privy. And Scott uh, noted this, and then this was taken up by his successor, uh, Harold Plenderleith, and he again noted that silver was readily tarnished, but he also then began to look at what other materials within the museum might produce reduced sulphide gases, and he says things such as vulcanized rubber floor coverings, draft excluding seals, cheap paint. I don't, it's not specific about what a cheap paint is uh, or what it might contain. And then materials containing uh, casein or lithopone. Lithopone um, is, is a pigment uh, which is a combination of a sulphide and an oxide, so it can release the sulphide and have the same effect as, as hydrogen sulphide on materials. Um, more recently, there's a, a realisation that it's not simply um, hydrogen sulphide that's responsible for this damage, that other reduced sulphide species, particularly carbonyl sulphide, uh, or dimethyl sulfide can also uh, act upon objects. And rather alarmingly, of course, that visitors and their clothing uh, can be huge sources of these materials. And of course, if we then, as we now fairly well know, place wool and silk fabrics, those things, contain, those things containing a cysteine linkage within their amino acid structure in showcases, these can be a source of, of sulphide gases. And again, these two references are very useful for, for tying up the materials and the pollutants they, they generate. So giving lists of commonly used materials in museum showcase storage, packing environments, and how those might generate pollutants which cause the damage that we, we saw in the earlier section, and which are also tabulated, particularly in uh, PS198. So could one have predicted that these uh, conditions would give rise to deterioration of the shells? 
Well, as we know, Bain suspected that incomplete cleaning of the shell had left a little bit of organic matter and that then this organic matter had fermented in some way and the fermentation had produced um, butyric acid which had interacted with the shell. And so what he did, being quite scientifically minded, was he extracted some material from another shell, uh, he caused it to ferment, and then he looked to see if it interacted with new material. Um, he doesn't seem to have found a great deal, but it is perhaps an early form of material testing, actually taking um, a representative object, another shell, taking a test material, in this case, the innards of a conch, and seeing what happens when you place the two together. And the specification for environmental conditions in collections suggests that one should test all the materials used to construct enclosures to make sure that they don't um, emit pollutants that would cause damage in an irreversible way. And in most museums, you know, the idea is to try and establish some kind of database of safe materials that one might use in this way. <laughs> So why, why might we test? Well, I think there are th three points here. We, we've already seen that materials that are very common in display environments have the potential to emit uh, materials that can cause deterioration. And we don't want to throw away the benefits sometimes of having an enclosed space. I mean, the, I'll say something about this a little later, but, but actually there are often other good reasons why one, one wants an enclosed space, to keep out dust, to keep out hands, um, or to maintain an environment within the case, which is the usual reason that we have uh, a sealed display case. And of course, ultimately, testing materials in this way uh, and making sure we avoid damage is actually a more cost-effective way to proceed than having to deal with the damage that it creates in the long term. And we've already heard the words oddy and testing this morning, and I suspect we will hear them a great deal more over the next few days. So I, I thought I'd just very quickly look at what's happened over the last uh, 40 years since uh, the, the oddy test was introduced. So 1973, the year after the great Tutankhamun exhibition at the British Museum, so place it in context, you know, that's now passed into folklore, the Oddy test perhaps now also founded back in folklore. Um, it's not stood still since 1973, but the basic premise I think is the same. So one takes three metal coupons, lead, silver, copper, put them in a sealed vessel with the sample of material you wish to test, age at 60 degrees for one month, and then make this assessment of the metal coupons in comparison with uh, descriptions, photographs, samples of other coupons that have deteriorated in the same way, to try and make this categorization, you know, kind of traffic-like categorization of, categorization of suitable for permanent storage or display use, short-term or unsuitable. The fact that the coupons are lead, silver, and copper. It's perhaps not, not surprising. Uh, Andrew Oddy was a metallurgist and a numismatist, so his main interest you know, when setting up this test was to protect those metal collections. It was to look at what the effect might be on the metal-based collections. And over the years, there has been a series of developments, and I've, I've not put them all in here. They've been very, very nicely summarised by my colleague Julie Fippard uh, at the British Museum, who's written a very nice chronology of the way in which the Oddy test has changed over the years. But essentially, the, the original test had the three metals each in separate enclosures. They were in, they were in flasks, which were stoppered four weeks, 60 degrees C. That seems to be the one thing that's not really changed, that length of time and that temperature. Um, about 20 years on, there was a major re-evaluation looking at different metal qualities, um, different types of uh, seals, 
using a separate tube for the cotton wool. You know, so it was all about making sure, it was often about making sure that there was no interac direct interaction between materials other than gas phase uh, in interactions. And then at this, around the same time as that redevelopment were these big sets of interlaboratory tests to, addressing this point that there were not always strong correspondences between the results achieved by one laboratory and those achieved by another. And there was a kind of a workshop where people came together to discuss procedures used and to try and hammer out um, a particular protocol for the future. And then some around this time, the, the MET 3-in-1 method was developed. Um, probably, I, I, maybe colleagues from the MET may have more definite dates, but it was developed long before it was published. It was published in 99, but actually had been in use for some time before. Um, and then a couple of years later, the, the British Museum produced the so-called occasional paper uh, on the subject, which presented a, a standardised version of the test procedure and also information about how to conduct uh, procedures for looking for other pollutants, so the, 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 the azide test, for example. And then in 2001, the three-in-one test is developed, and that was then incorporated into the updated version of this uh, occasional paper produced by the British Museum in 2004, which is sadly out of print, but it is now, you can download it uh, from the British Museum website um, for, for free. And so at that point, the three-in-one test, where the three metal coupons are in the same tube, um, but carefully separated so they don't interact with each other, was, was introduced. And then in, in 2008, there was, uh, I can't remember, it had a rather catchy title, something odd with the Audi test or something like that, that the, the Met discovered some very strange results um, where one was not getting uh, a positive result from an Audi test with materials that really were known to be quite serious uh, threats to collections because the glassware was interacting with the pollutants before it could reach uh, the, the test coupons. And then in, in 2000, and, well, I, I'm not quite sure the date, there was a lot of testing. Julie's here in the audience. She may be able to tell you exactly when it went online. But the test database was incorporated uh, into the British Museum website and made available with about five years' results. And it's subsequently been uh, incorporated with results from other institutions into the AIC wiki. And I'm not even going to start on this because we have a, uh, a session entirely on the, the AIC wiki uh, to come later this morning. So what are the limitations? Well, the, I think they centre around three things. That is the test procedure, interpretation of the results of testing, and the applicability of the testing to the hazards, to the object. So it's really how we test and, and what we test for. And as I've already hinted, that there are a huge number of different variables, some of which have been addressed in these various kind of reviews of the procedure over the years. Quality of the coupon, the way in which the coupon is cleaned before it's used in the test, the shape, of the, the vessel, what the vessel's made of, how you make your seals, whether these are truly inert, whether they seal well, um, how you clean the vessels between uh, experiments, or do you simply throw your vessels away between, after you've used them once, the amount of water in the vessels and, and the amount of test material. Interpretation is, again, very difficult. There's, there's no really... Uh, consistent protocol for it. It's mostly done subjectively. And these boundaries between these three categories are very indistinct. Um, and what actually do we mean by short, medium, and long term in our own museum context? For some people, short term exhibition might be three years. For other people, it might be few, finish that, it's done for the short term, meaning two to three years. And so there are, there are things that can create false positives. In other words, something else causes the, the metal tokens to, to tarnish, not the test material. So things can be defined as either 
those associated with incomplete cleaning of the glassware, improper preparation of the metal, or it can be that something else being used, so for example, the stoppers or bungs, can be a source of pollutants. So something else inside the enclosure is affecting the tokens. False negatives, well, for some reason, material produced by the uh, test substance doesn't reach the metal coupon. So generally, this is probably because it reacts with something else. And I think this was the root of the issue that the, the Met pointed out, that because they were using a particular type of soda glass, certain pollutants were reacting with the soda glass preferentially to the metal coupons within the enclosure. And then we can get a sort of mixture of false positives and negatives if, if the material is not representative. Um, we, we may have a, a paint that's prepared in a way that is not actually allowing it enough time to dry. It might be applied onto uh, a substance which itself uh, causes deterioration. So you know, there's been a lot of uh, work into the materials we use for paint outs to ensure we don't get this kind of thing. And of course then we're, we're in the situation where we're, we're testing a single material and in the kind of cocktail of materials that are produced within uh, a sealed environment from different materials, interactions between those materials can cause damage. And I think that's going to be the subject of at least one paper uh, during these two days. Uh, so what are we missing? Well, we've optimised, of course, for metal corrosion for the reasons that uh, we, I outlined earlier. Um, we don't know what the corrosion products are most of the time. We just know that it's made a bit of a mess of a silver coupon. Um, certain pollutants, are, classes of pollutants, are missed entirely. And there's often a lack of a parallel between that test situation and the installation in the enclosure. So that mixture of materials, the different curing times, different batches of material. You know, sometimes one has a note in the database that, you know, green fabric from this manufacturer is fine, and suddenly the the batch changes, the formulation changes. I, I got badly caught out many years ago by testing, actually in this case, the light fastness of a series of wall fabrics uh, provided by a manufacturer. And that when the fabric was put on the wall, it faded. And I, I, thought I, I thought I was going to lose my job until we discovered that the materials they provided before for testing hadn't had a fire retardant applied to them. And the fire retardant suddenly caused this beautiful green silk fabric, very expensive fabric, to fade uh, in, 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 a, in a matter of months. So what might the future hold? Well, obviously a more consistent methodology and a more consistent way of assessing things, but also uh, complementary methodologies. And, and I think both of these aspects are going to be talked about, so I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, Better characterization of degradation products, for example, using uh, X-ray diffraction to look at the crystalline products formed uh, by interaction of metals with pollutants. Um, complementary techniques to, to look at the organic pollutants that are not picked up by the audit test, the so-called VOC. So SPME uh, has been used in this context, and I think we're going to hear about that in the next couple of days. So. The final question, were the specimens themselves responsible for the deterioration? Well, well Bein thought so. Bein was probably not correct in this case, but it alerts us to the fact that often it's not just the materials from which the showcase, the display case, the storage environment, the packing case are made that we need to worry about. We need to worry about other objects within the case, or sometimes the objects themselves. So if we place, for example, cellulose acetate objects in a case, th there is this well-known vinegar syndrome that affects them. And of course, this means they're giving out acetic acid. And if they're anywhere near metal objects, then they're going to cause uh, acetate formation on those metal objects, or indeed on shells or ceramic objects. And of course, they're, they're destroying themselves as well. And the buildup of acetic acid that's caused in an enclosed space auto-catalyzes that destruction if they're in a sealed area uh, 
then they're going to deteriorate more quickly than if we allow the degradation products to dissipate somewhat. And the same uh, is the case with cellulose nitrate objects. Again, they are producing uh, nit uh, nitrous oxide. It can oxidize, it can form acidic uh, compounds which can affect other materials in the vicinity, but the cellulose nitrate itself is deteriorating. Of course, the under the most spectacular circumstances, particularly in old film stock, we know that these, it can spontaneously combust and explode, which is now why a lot of cellulose nitrate film finds itself in large bunkers outside city centres rather than in our repositories. And in a situation where you have two materials in the same object, of course, there's really absolutely nothing you can do under these circumstances. You have the source of, uh, in this case, uh, this cellulose nitrate uh, and silver composite object. So you have the nitric acid being produced pretty much adjacent to silver, causing kind of an, an internal system of deterioration. I'm, under these circumstances, of course, we, we, we really ought to consider quite carefully whether or not ventilating is the best way to get around this problem. If we have objects where we don't need um, a, a strongly controlled environment for some reason, having a, a moderately ventilated case is a good idea. I mean, I, I've shown here an example for a painting where this is a painting kept in a case just to keep people from from touching it and getting too near it. The case is extremely leaky because the environment outside is perfectly suitable for the painting inside. And so one doesn't then allow the build-up of materials within the case. And then we can use uh, sorbents to try and take the pollutants out of the air before they, they interact with, with the objects. So in some cases, it's a static material, it's, you know, for example, a buffered box or uh, a foams impregnated with uh, nanoparticles of copper have been used to react with pollutants because they have a very large surface area which tends preferentially to react. Or in the case of this so-called silver pump, which is used at the British Museum, this, the air from the case is simply circulated through this filter bed on the top left of the picture, where the reduced sulfides are absorbed from the atmosphere on each cycle of the air through the pump. And we can, we can use scavengers. So sometimes we will put sacrificial pieces of polished metal into cases or environments. Um, preferentially to react with pollutants. And a, a similar sort of material uh, interaction is involved with the use, as I've said, of these impregnated uh, copper polymers or foams that have been, been tested for their ability to absorb particularly uh, reduced sulfur gases. So what are the things that we can take from Bine. Well, the deterioration was in sealed or poorly ventilated enclosures, so we're increasingly creating these. So it's not something that's gone away. It's a problem that was seen by Bine, perhaps not entirely understood by him, but which we are now generating for ourselves in the way that we are moving things into showcases. And as we try to become more energy efficient as museums, we are often putting more things in showcases to avoid the need to condition the temperature and relative humidity in entire gallery spaces. So it's seen as a way of saving on the air conditioning bill to put things in cases and simply maintain the temperature and relative humidity in a small enclosure rather than a whole building. But of course, we're making potentially an issue for ourselves by, by building a, a sealed environment. Analyzing the deterioration product can help to identify the pollutant and the potential source. Well, Bein sort of got it half right and half wrong. He identified calcium acetate. He didn't quite get the source right. I mean, he thought it was uh, the, the labels and the gum in the labels. We would now say it's wood. But by identifying the degradation product in his eyes as calcium butyrate, he was then able to look at what it was 
might have produced the calcium, calcium butyrate. So this kind of reverse engineering where we find out what the deterioration product is and then try and trace it back to what might be the source of the pollutant can be quite useful. Or we can go the other way around and we can test materials that we're going to use as potential sources of harmful pollutants. And the ODI test, of course, is one of the, the tests that we use regularly. It has the benefit of being relatively simple. It's quite simple to set up an ODI test compared to going out and buying an X-ray diffractometer or um, a GC setup of, of some type. But nevertheless, we, we might not get all the information we want from the simple test. And it serves as a good point of screening to move on to more complex tests. And finally, the objects themselves can be the sources of harmful emissions. Again, by this case, it wasn't. But it's useful in alerting us to the fact that it's often the objects that we place in showcases that cause deterioration either to themselves or to other objects in the vicinity. And I, I think my concluding remark, we, we, we don't understand all the different types of interaction between materials and the things they off-gas and the objects in those cases. And so there is definitely uh, a place for, for further research in this area and for new and improved testing methodologies. And of course, that's what I hope the next two days will introduce us to these, these new studies, these new methodologies, potential hazards that we're perhaps we're not aware of now and things we can take away with us uh, to look for in the future. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank various colleagues who provided me with, with information for this presentation. Thank you.